It is a pretty cool little idea that the other three people banning in the intro are avatars, so you realize that this is an older Aang. The Revelation, not a whole lot to that title, I think. We discover Amon has some wacky powers this episode, and that's what this title's referring to. They're not all poetic. A chance encounter turns Korra from pro-bending spectator to pro-bending star. The radio announcer doing the recaps is fine, it's a fine idea, but man, this sucks. I don't get to look out for different line reads in the last time on Avatar segments anymore. Man, that building is yellow. Up until now, other than in the episode one intro, I guess, this building has only been shown at night, and there your brain kind of assumes that the building is just being lit extremely harshly, and that's why it looks like that. But no, it's just really, really yellow. Like, wow kind of yellow. Who decided that the pro-bending arena was going to be made out of gold? Seems like those resources kind of went somewhere else. And you're the rookiest of us all. We got to get you up to speed if we want to survive in the tournament. Deal with it. What the fuck is Mako's problem at the start, right? He's never this needlessly hostile to anyone else, and there's never a moment where he's like, oh, sorry, here's why I was being a dick. I guess they just wanted Korra to have someone to push her buttons before the threat of Amon was more clear. The fire ferrets need to ante up 30,000 yuans for the championship pot. What are yuans anyway? Each nation seemed to have their own currency in Airbender. The Water Tribe money was literally just called Water Tribe money even. Hey, Water Tribe money. The Fire Nation had these different coins, and the Earth Kingdom seemed to use these coins. I guess one of Aang's avatar feats was to create a new currency that everyone can use, at least in Republic City, considering he's the face on the whatever you want amount bill this is. So, anyway... Oh shit, they got zipper technology too? They didn't have that back in Avatar. Yeah, I know they got like radios and electricity, but zippers are cool too. We got a statue of Zuko here, it's not hung on very much like the statues of Aang and Toph, but he's got one. You can come back here and put money right in this... Okay, that's fine. That's fine. One yuan down, 29,999 to go. Okay, so you got paper yuans worth an unknown amount, and gold coins worth one yuan. And now, yeah, probably the paper yuans just represent a number of the actual gold coins stored away in a bank somewhere. But still, seems weird that they're using seemingly real gold and then paper money also. Heard you're a big time pro bending player now. Surely the term would be pro bender, right? That way it would even play into the whole anti bender movement. Anti bender versus pro bender. No, that's stupid. All right, man, relax. I know a lot of people don't like what Korra has done to Lightning. This little five second scene has drawn a lot of ire from a lot of people. And I agree, this is too much. Lightning and Avatar felt special, so having it demoted to something that you need on a resume to get a normal blue collar job feels like a really big downgrade. It steals a lot of the mysticism. In the comics that I covered, go watch those videos, nudge nudge, Lightning also got a lot of different stuff done to it, but the chief problem I had with it is that Azula could do seemingly a quick fire, less damaging version of it, which isn't what Lightning is supposed to be at all, according to Iroh, and it seems that Korra is going with that sort of thing too. So I'm gonna do it. I don't think this is lightning generation. I don't think it's got the stopping power. I'm calling this electricity bending and I will be calling this electricity bending in the future. Get mad at me in the comments. I'm ready. Bo, I'm back. Bo? Cora, is that the handsome firebender boy that drives you crazy? Does he drive you crazy in a bad way? Or does he drive you crazy like you like him? Hey Cora, it's me Mako. Why did you just send those kids flying? Well... This is his usual hangout. He just hangs out in front of the Zuko statue, alone? Even when he's not panhandling? What does he do, he just stands there? It doesn't seem like you guys really have any friends. My memory's a little foggy. Maybe you can help clear it up. You're good, Scoochie. Scoochie? This power line up here doesn't connect anything, it just kinda ends. Shady Shin showed up and flashed some serious cash. Bo took off with him in his hot rod. The triple threats, the red monsoons, the Agni Kais? All the triads are muscling up for something real big. Alright, Scoochie, thanks for the exposition dump. That's all I really needed. In fact, that's more than I needed. Thanks, homie. Hey, it's a rare shot where some of those metal bending wires are actually seeable. Nice. You'll notice that in most shots, they are very much not. Oh, you son of a bitch, we were doing good. We were one for two on not full moons. Now we're back to this shit. Something's not right. There are usually thugs posted out front. We better be cautious. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's be cautious. Let's just play Mako being cautious back one or two more times. Mako's version of being cautious is just walking around janky right out in the open. You can hear some yelling and some dogs barking in the background. You'll probably have to turn your volume way up, but that's a nice touch for making the city seem like it's alive, even if it's just something you notice subconsciously. Pull in! So was that poison? Or just smoke? Why was it green? Okay, I'm not immune to spectacle. The idea of an avatar fight car chase kind of thing on motorcycles is really cool. But I'm pretty much a sucker for an avatar fight scene that takes place in any cool location. 
Those are called boluses, by the way. Korra and Mako go flying, and Mako's way over here, and it looks like they're gonna hit the ground at the same time. But then in the next shot, he hits the ground after her and totally in line with her. This is our first proper fight scene in Korra, basically, and I gotta say, it's pretty good. All the action seems punchy, and there's some pretty interesting physical moves incorporated. But you ever think, like, where are they right now? They're just in this enormous vacant lot in Republic City. It's like hundreds of feet wide and long. No one's using the space for anything. Also in the shot, this camera does this weird digital pan that early Korra likes to incorporate a lot. And even though most of those camera movements usually look pretty good, this one makes it seem like the bad guy Flintstone runs in place for two seconds here. Here, right here. See what I mean? Mm. Oh, I can't bend. Mm. I can't bend! Weird that Amon's chi blockers are training the chi blocking that takes your bending rather than the one that just turns off your limbs and makes you not be able to bend anyway. Maybe there's a medium level where it kind of does both because the previous fight scene definitely wants you to think Korra can't use her arm after she gets multi-jabbed. Why is Bolin running around with a triple threat triad anyway? Well, we... We used to do some work for them back in the day. What? I just ran numbers for them and stuff. I don't buy that shit, Mako. You're a firebender who was good enough to be a pro bending player, and you can electricity bend. You didn't run numbers. They wouldn't care that you were a kid. They would have used you. Can I ask what happened to your parents? <sighs> they were mugged by a firebender. He cut them down right in front of me. I was eight. Mako is just Batman, and Bolin is just happier Batman. It's like the most boring, uninspired, tragic backstory ever. Random act of violence, darn. Someone like Jet had a way more interesting backstory, even though it's pretty much the same. The difference is, is that Jet's parents were killed by an invading army, and that galvanized them into being a guerrilla terrorist. Mako and Bolin are just like dudes trying to get by. Wait, I've got a theory. The firebender who killed his parents was actually Aang, and that's why he's so weirdly mean and closed off to Korra for seemingly no reason. He hates the Avatar, it all makes sense and he gets to have like a cool backstory if anything happened to him then there's this really weird cut where mako is struggling to talk and then it just cuts to some leaves and then whoopsie daisy accidentally leaning on each other while they nap i guess that's one way to further a character relationship just skip the actual talk that would be meaningful and then make them be cute and awkward seems kind of lazy you cannot silence me avatar <laughs> Shut your yapper and listen up. This seems like a pretty good scene on paper. You're supposed to see that Korra is actually part of the problem that this guy spends all day yelling about, I think. Because she almost immediately turns to using her bending to intimidate and threaten this dude. But the show never really turns the lens back on Korra and her actions. It's just like, all right, tight, we got the info, moving on. Where's it happening? Hey, what's going on over there? The Avatar's suppressing us! Help! I mean, he's kind of right this time, right? I bet the information is hidden on here somehow. Look at the backs. There's four different images. How the fuck you know that by only seeing three? There could have been 30 different images. Bingo. That must be where it's going down. This red dot that will likely take up who knows how many buildings on a city map? Got it. Korra just has Mako's scarf after we transition scenes. It's definitely more important for her identity to stay hidden, so it makes sense. But it feels like we missed another beat of them connecting when we learn later that it's Mako's dad's scarf. This is a private event. No one gets in without an invitation. Haru's dad? Lion Turtle? Why isn't the crowd filling out the room? That firebender took my family from me. Then... He took my face. So Amon's story is supposed to naturally mirror Mako's. We just heard about how a firebender took Mako's family as well. So we should be getting this palpable sense of maybe Amon isn't totally in the wrong. He has his story and we have a friend with a nearly identical one. These problems are real and they affect people on both sides of the issue. And I think that's effective for a conflict that's supposed to be nuanced. But the problem is, is that Amon's actions and plans aren't conveyed to us as nuanced at all. And our main cast most definitely don't see the nuance I feel like the show is trying to get across this episode at any point. And we'll get more into those thoughts as the season goes on. The only thing bending has brought to the world is suffering. It has been the cause of every war in every era. Here we hear that Amon is mostly just spewing rhetoric though. Since the viewers know the main conflict of Airbender wasn't caused by bending, it was caused by Sozin being deluded and Roku not having the gumption to put those power hungry thoughts to rest. It was mostly fought by bending, but bending wasn't the cause. I mean, it's a good speech for those present at the rally, but any viewer that's been paying attention should know that Amon is just trying to rile people up, which probably in the end makes him more interesting at the moment. The power to take a person's bending away permanently. And this is where we kind of start checking off boxes with Korra when you think about it. And this wouldn't be the first one you think would be checked. Basically all the villains in this show have their own either special power or advanced form of bending to make them seem strong like a real foe. But I gotta give them props, I wouldn't have went with fake energy bending first. Now for a demonstration. Please welcome Lightning Bolt Zolt. Lieutenant just let Amon do the pointing man, you look like you're on stage and you don't know what to do with your hands. There's Bolin. 
Wait. We can't fight them all. No, you most certainly cannot fight them all. You two lost to two chi blockers in a straight up even fight. You guys should honestly feel terrified in this situation. Is Lightning Bolt Zolt Mako's father? He has the same dumb eyebrows. Either that or both this mob boss and the pro athlete style their eyebrows in the same way. And that might be even less likely than the Zolt is his dad proposition. <laughs> See, this is what I mean. Look at it. This is electricity bending. Nearly no wind up. It's fired faster than even Ozai could. Nearly no damage done to anything it hits, which we know is not the case for lightning. And he's sustaining it, which is never shown to be done in airbender. It's like a completely different move from lightning generation in every single way. Plus, weirdly, as Amon takes its bending, it goes from electricity and then seems to downgrade directly to fire. I guess it doesn't make no sense, and it's a cool idea for a shot, but you definitely get the feeling in airbender that lightning is way more than just fire level two. <laughs> What did you do to me? This is a direct call back to Aang taking Ozai's bending. He does the same exact thing and delivers the same exact line. What? What did you do to me? Is there a problem, my brother? What are you doing back here? Uh... Looking for the bathroom? This is the second time Korra has used this excuse to middling effect both times. <laughs> Thanks. This should be enough. Korra, your friend is about to be crippled for life. Can we please get the lead out here? Stop quipping. What the fuck? How strong are you? There's a couple moments of cartoon strength like this in Korra, but like the hug moment from the first episode, they're usually played for gags, but this is a serious situation. We're in an escape slash fight scene, and Mako can do this? That implies he's for real that strong. He just threw that guy like he was a feather pillow. Why didn't you just do that against the chi blockers earlier? <laughs> Mako, just throw him, Mako. Mako! I get that the bad guys need to feel strong, but can we at least get a hit in on them? Our heroes feel kind of useless against anyone they go up against in a real fight. Other than sneak attacks, I guess. The Avatar, that's her! Let her go. Aw, oh, but Amon, we were just non mowing bro. Yeah, no, confirmed, no clouds or anything this time. We are two full moons to one non-full. I'm keeping a tally this time because I think it's a lot closer to even, at least. He can take people's bending away. For good. That's... that's impossible. Only the Avatar has ever possessed that ability. That's an interesting line from Tenzin. It implies that Aang wasn't the only Avatar to ever hold that power, since Tenzin doesn't say only my father had that ability. But Airbender does seem to imply that only very few or maybe more ancient Avatars did, since none of Aang's past lives he communed with ever mentioned it as an option. But yeah, it definitely doesn't seem like required learning for the Avatar. This means the revolution is more dangerous than ever. No bender is safe. Cool stinger, because now suddenly Korra and Tenzin, both as unique and important benders, are threatened in a way they could have never imagined. As far as revelations go, it's a good one to hang on. All right, the revelation, episode three. Things are kicking into motion now. The whole episode is mostly trying to endear Korra and Mako to one another, as well as set up Amon's power and reach. And I think it definitely achieves the latter. Amon's setup is very chilling. It's played very straight. And there's this awful feeling you get from him doing these horrible actions in front of a cheering crowd. That really makes him feel more like a problem even outside of his currently unexplained magic superpower he has to take people's bending. The Korra and Mako stuff doesn't really hit for me ever, basically, but especially now, I think they should have found some more effective way for them to bond since it's really the first moments they're getting to know each other. And there's gonna be this whole thing with them and Asami going forward. So you would think they'd want these first few moments to be really strong, right? I think this one's a mixed bag. Some elements are good, some are pretty friggin' good, and others not so good. Still, I don't think we've ever approached an episode of Korra being bad TV, so good job on that level. Patreon shoutouts, if you to see the next two episodes of Overanalyzing Korra, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons, Omega Fighter, who had a spell placed on him at a young age that any name he gave something would be accurate. So what did he name his miniature schnauzer? Star Crusher, naturally. Sean Martin, who was the first to Robin Hood three darts together in a round, all on triple 20, of course, so everyone just packed up the tournament and said that he won. Stephanie Riches, who finally, after all of these years, killed the final Nazi vampire. I wouldn't have thought they would have been a manager at an international house of pancakes either, so I get it taking a while. Thomas Lautenbach, who can moonwalk on water, landing him the nickname of Moon Jesus. Tiago Nascimento, who fell out of a tree as a kid and broke both his ankles, but once they healed, he was suddenly one of the top 10 tap dancers in the world, with no practice or study. And Whitrow, who wanted to make the most spectacular crash in the world, so he put a bike in a car, which was then put onto a truck, which then got put onto a plane, which was finally loaded onto a large yacht. That was then crashed into some rocks on the water. He called it the turducken of tragedy. And of course, my god over 
analyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, Andrew Watrid, Austin Gallup, Bob Deff, Dizzy Payne, Dr. Xerox, Dominic Saint, Donut, Distent, Aaron Grace, Jackson, John Ajaka, Justin Fletchall, Justin Wells, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Reese, Rocket Mist, Ryan Gregorikos, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatt, Super Snipper, Trans Women Are Women, Turt Bobs, and some sort of bare face, I don't know. Next up, we round out our cast and our first little face-off.